Hello, welcome to the monthly lecture series of the National Capital Area Skeptics, NCAS, also known as NCAS. I'm Scott Snell, president of NCAS, speaking to you from my home in the Washington DC area. Now, some of you might associate the word skeptic with closed-minded or scoffing at new ideas, but that's not what skeptic means in our use of the word. Skeptic is derived from Greek words that mean thoughtful, to look, to consider. We ask tough questions and follow the evidence wherever it may lead us, whether it's where we thought it would or where we would have liked it to or otherwise. Skeptics in the DC area formed NCAS 35 years ago this week. On March 29th, 1987, more than 100 subscribers to a magazine called Skeptical Inquirer attended the inaugural meeting to found the National Capital Area Skeptics forming an independent membership organization to objectively examine claims of paranormal phenomena and fringe science, and more generally to promote critical thinking and scientific understanding. I was there that day, along with a friend of mine, a fellow physics student, who had loaned me a copy of his Skeptical Inquirer magazine about a year before. After reading it, I got my own subscription immediately. It was an eye-opener, actually a mind-opener for me. Its articles about astrology, UFOs, psychic powers, and so on, were an antidote to the nonsense you'd see in news media coverage of those topics. One of the writers for the Skeptical Inquirer was there that day. That was the first time I met Philip J. Class, an aerospace journalist by profession, but also an investigator of UFO reports, the top investigator, actually. His book, UFOs Explained, was also a mind opener for me. Class was an important part of founding NCAS and a mentor to our organization. And he was a mentor to our speaker today. It's my pleasure to introduce Robert Schaefer. Mr. Schaefer is one of the leading skeptical investigators of unidentified flying objects, UFOs. I mentioned Skeptical Inquirer. Robert Schaefer contributed a column in every issue from 1977 to 2017. He's the author of UFO Sightings, The Evidence, and of his most recent book, Bad UFOs. That's also the name of his blog that casts a skeptical eye on claims about UFOs. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us from the Golden State, San Diego, California, Mr. Robert Schaefer. So Thank Robert, you. hi, it's, it's great to have you join us today. Uh, we chatted a bit before the cameras start rolled, rolling here. And uh, I, I reminded you how we met. Um, this was back in late 2009 at a UFO conference you helped organize uh, called, I looked it up, UFOs, the Space Age Mythology. And uh, uh, several hours before the conference started in the dark of night, you and I were in an observatory with James McGahey at his Sabino Canyon Observatory, watching the South Pole of the Moon through a telescope. And uh, we knew that a rocket booster was about to intentionally slam into a crater um, that's believed to contain water ice. And if people want to Google this, uh, look up L-C-R-O-S-S, L-Cross. And the mission I'm an engineer for at NASA Goddard here, a lunar reconnaissance orbiter, was also observing the impact site to analyze the, uh, the plume that would come from the impact. Anyway, you and I had James McGahey, we didn't see the plume. In fact, no one on earth saw the plume that night, but LRO and L Cross did. And that was when the presence of water on the moon was confirmed a big scientific discovery and significant for future human space exploration. Anyway, uh, I felt like it was exciting for us to at least have a look. I thought later, I wonder if that's how UFO hunters feel when they go home after a long night without having seen something mysterious. Um, anyway, do you have any memories of that evening? Uh, yeah, you know, well, I remember going out to the McGehee to the observatory down there at um, south of Tucson, quite a ways, almost to the Mexican border. And uh, it's quite dark out there. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's very good for getting pictures of stars. I remember um, sitting outside and watching meteors and such. And we actually saw a green fireball. Oh, very part bright. of UFO lore, yes. Right, which is very, you know, it's, it's, it, it looms large in UFO lore, the idea of that there are green fireballs and that these are somehow related to spacecraft or something like that. 
But of course, it depends on the metallic content of the meteor. Is it copper or whatever? It's going to glow green, and it's you know if it's a different color, if it's iron and whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these things do have, but it was very bright and uh, several of us who were outside noticed it. And so it was, uh, was quite, uh, quite exciting to me, even if mm -hmm. we didn't see the uh, plume of anything on the moon. That's right. Um, obviously, I want to ask you about UFOs today, about aliens. Um, but first, I thought, let's talk about humans. Uh, tell us about yourself and eventually how you met Philip Class, uh, your mentor and, and ours with NCAS. Well, I um, started out uh, being very interested in astronomy and such uh, from an early age. And I remember going out when I was just a kid, when there was a close approach of uh, Mars to the Earth and it was unusually bright. And I remember my dad taking me outside and we were looking for it. And neither one of us knew where it was, but there was this bright red object. And my dad says, well, I guess that must be Mars, which yeah, I'm sure it was. And uh, and I got a telescope when I was, I don't know, maybe 10 years old. And, uh, we were living in a suburb of Chicago and it wasn't very dark there. So a lot of lights around, but I still could see a lot and got a few more telescopes. I went to Northwestern, which wasn't all that far from where, uh, where I grew up. And of course at that, and I was very interested in astronomy, mathematics, physics, whatever. And uh, at that time, of course, at Northwestern was the late Dr. J. Allen Hynek who was the head of the astronomy department and head of the observatory, the Dearborn Observatory. And they even had, he, Heineck had arranged to fund with, from Rich Alumni or whatever, another observatory out there, Lindheimer Observatory, which was a big thing with two, like, uh, they look like silos connected with, with beams and they had telescopes in each one. Okay. And, uh, I understand they they torn those down because you can't being so close to Chicago you can't really see anything so wasn't Light a good coach. idea wasn't a good idea to build a large observatory in a spot like that better to spend your money somewhere else mm -hmm. but uh, I guess the idea was well it's convenient because you know we got our offices in this building right here we just go out to the observatory but uh, if you can't see anything <laughs> mm -hmm. then that's a problem but. Uh, and so I got to know Alan Hynek, and I, I had a number of conversations with him. I took a number of his classes and classes from other, you know, astronomy professors, as well as, you know, math classes. I ended up being a math major, although I had enough astronomy classes to be an astronomy major, but I didn't have enough physics to be an astronomy major. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but I also, you know, and, and tried to talk to Hynek about, you know, the idea of, you know, Occam's razor and, especially the fallibility of eyewitnesses. That's the one main point, I think, that he and I disagreed. He okay. seemed to think, and a lot of people in ufology seem to think that, well, Joe Blow over here is a very educated guy. He has a college degree. He has a responsible position in the community. And he says he saw, you know, his spacecraft go over with windows and whatever. And so he must be telling the truth. It must really have happened. Okay. And, uh, you just start to look at all these things. I remember at that time I was getting um, researching like uh, from historical accounts of people who said they, they you know, from the so-called witchcraft trials, people who testify, why well, I saw this woman change herself into a rabbit. You know, <laughs> and well, those credible persons reporting incredible things. Uh -huh. uh, and so some people took it seriously, but then others said, wait a minute, this, this and then the, the, uh, Royal Society of London, which was the, the first scientific society in the, in the modern sense, uh, organized 1660, I think. And their, um, their motto was nullius in verba, basically meaning that uh, words don't count for anything or more colloquially, don't take anybody's word for it. Uh, and I'm going to all this business about Heineck. I'll get to, to class in a minute because this Heineck you know, this stuff came first. Yes. And so, and, but then around that same time, uh, Class had just written a book called UFOs Identified, mm -hmm. in which he talks about plasma UFOs because of certain accounts that people claim they saw UFOs hovering over power lines. Uh, and uh, then he was hypothesizing that there'd be some sort of plasma phenomenon because of the electricity and the wires that sets up this glowing plasma that sits there for a short time. And I guess if you take enough uh, 
eyewitness accounts you can you know put together a scenario like that but um realistically when you allow for the unreliability of eyewitness testimony this whole idea of plasma balls glowing there it doesn't make much sense because what powers it what keeps it glowing the yes. amount of energy that would be needed to keep that thing going for more than a tiny fraction of a second is far more than is conceivable but even in that first book class was into hoaxes and he was exposing hoaxes there yes. were several hoaxes that he he exposed in that first book um and so then i uh contacted class uh, and i told him i was a student at northwestern and then i was talking with heinrich and so on and so he was very interested to hear all this. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, uh, and I, I, you know, he had some you know, ideas. Oh, well, here's a question you might want to ask Heineck or something. So, so I did. And um, I think Heineck was a very sincere guy, but he, he was kind of soft in the sense that you know, he wasn't a hard headed thinker to say, well, it's got to be either this or that. It was kind of like, well, maybe it's this, or maybe it's that. And mm-hmm. um, he was big on, you know, as, astronomy, his, history of astronomy and history of science. So Heineck clearly understood these things. But, um, you know, it's, it's like what I said, what the old, uh, and, and I have this in my book, you'll see this chapter. And if you dig up my uh, UFO sightings book, I have a chapter on uh, Joseph Glanville who was a member, he he was an English clergyman, although a a liberal clergyman. um, And he was also an amateur scientist, because I guess in those days, every scientist was an amateur scientist. Uh, But he argued that, Glanville argued that reliable witness testimony proves the existence of witches, as I mentioned briefly before. (laughs) And, uh, And in fact, he called himself these people who uh, were trying to uh, form the new science, uh, scientific societies, called themselves the Invisible College, which is then Heineck and Ballet later were using that term for, for their buddies. And I, I don't think it's, uh, it's not really uh, the appropriate, but uh, that's a term they want to use. Um, so that then uh, class, uh, he started, you know, we started corresponding on a number of things he thought I don't know if you're familiar with the famous Lucci photos. Um, it's the one that's on the cover of the uh, Interrupted Journey, the book. Um, it basically, it looks like a, a big round thing. What it really is, is it's, it's a plate resting on somebody's hand, illuminated by a flashlight. Mm-hmm. Class was, soda. yes. Yeah, class was, uh, at that time, was of the opinion that the boys had photographed a genuine uh, plasma UFO because there were some power lines out there where they were filming. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, but I, I convinced class that this is not true, that, that in fact, it was correct that uh, it was, uh, it, if you recall the Condon report was being prepared at this time. And I think it had just, just been published. This was uh, basically the Air Force's way of extricating themselves from the, uh, UFO conundrum that uh, there was just so much bad publicity, so many cases pouring in, and they didn't have enough explanations and enough people to explain it. And sometimes uh, they, if they couldn't find a good explanation, they'd go with a bad one. <laughs> yeah, Robert, if I may, um, yeah. just to give some background for people who are interested in UFOs, but maybe not knowing the history, Heineck was the Project Blue Book a scientific consultant. Uh, the Air Force hired him. I guess he was relatively close to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base when he was at Ohio State. So um, he did debunk cases, but later he sort of changed. And I I do want to ask you about that at some point. But uh, uh, there was a time when, you know, he described some Michigan UFOs as probably being swamp gas and actually future president Gerald Ford, a representative from Michigan, uh, objected to this um, yes. and, and uh, thought that there was more to investigate. And, you know, again, people can Google this to get into the details. Yeah. But what's really interesting to me is that you worked with, to some extent, J. Allen Hynek, who's on the, you know, the preeminent believer, that may be too strong a word, but the preeminent yeah. believer. And you worked later with the preeminent skeptic, 
So it's like uh, the uh, separate poles. And I'm wondering if you're the only person that can lay claim to that type of um, history. Well, among skeptics, I'm sure that's true. Now, there are a number of people who worked with Heineck, uh, you know, when he had a Center for UFO Studies and so on. Uh, a very interesting um, example is Ellen Hendry, uh, is a fellow who, uh, who used to be at Northwestern, used to be part of Heineck's uh, Center for UFO Studies. In fact, he was the chief UFO investigator. And Hendry wrote a book, I think late 70s, around 1980, uh, called the UFO Handbook. Uh, and it's basically talking about how to um, you know, investigate UFO sightings and all this. Well, the thing is, he was too good at explaining them. And especially he found a number of these cases that he himself had investigated in Illinois that were the, you know, the witnesses said, oh my God, we were outside and the thing came over so low, we had to duck down so it didn't hit us and whatever and whatever. Turns out that was an advertising airplane that had this banner with, you know, Eat at Joe's or something on the, on the banner being towed, illuminated banner. And he found several of these. And apparently he just got so many people upset, the donors with uh, the Center for UFO Studies. Uh, what are you doing trying to debunk all these cases and whatever? So, uh, and Henry, and I don't blame him. He wouldn't, he wouldn't put up with that. So he quit. He quit so completely that basically nobody yeah, you might have run into him in Tucson if you when you were there because I know he was working at one of those uh, aerospace companies. I don't really recall which one, but <laughs> he just got completely out of UFOs and stayed out. And in a sense, I said I, I can't blame him. If, you know, if I was treated that way, especially I mean, because he was doing very good investigations and very good research. <laughs> um, yeah, you mentioned also the Condon report, named after the the lead investigator of the. Uh, U.S. Air Force uh, hiring the University of Colorado to scientifically investigate UFO reports. And uh, so you had met up with Hynek. Is this in the late 60s? So maybe the... the I con- got, yeah, I got to uh, Northwestern in the fall of 67. Mm-hmm. So that's so right, yeah. right around <laughs> when um, University of Colorado was doing this it study. Was underway, it was underway. And they published, I think, in late 68 or early 69, someplace yes. around there. And uh, then there was a huge controversy for that whole time for several years. And, you know, how the kind of people were, were nasty to bunkers and so on. <laughs> and um, uh, you had already established contact with class and you were still, um, you know, working to some extent with Heineck at Northwest. Yeah, well, I, was, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I was working with him, but I knew him. I took his classes. We even had a seminar. Somebody organized a student seminar on UFOs, and I was, uh, uh, I was in that. In fact, uh, the, the it was something small, and the, and the enrollment had been capped at a certain number of twenty or something like that. By the time I heard about it, it was full, and I mentioned this to Heineck, and he was very, very. He went out of his way to say, "Well, all right, we'll let you in there since you have such a strong interest," and so. Uh, he made an exception for me, and I, I was very grateful for that. It was a very interesting uh, thing, and this is where we, we heard him talk about so many things. And uh, this was right at the time I remember when the late uh, uh, Dr. James E. McDonald, who was well known as a ufologist, he was down there at the uh, in Tucson at the University of Arizona. Yeah, uh, but he was also going all around, and you know. Uh, to give talks and appear on the radio TV shows and to, uh, uh, you know, they had these uh, congressional um, hearings that you alluded to briefly. Gerald Ford, I think, uh, organized one in the House, and I think it was a different one in the Senate, and they all got there to people to go in there and testify, mm-hmm. and nothing came of it because they told their beliefs. And that was yes, if, if but people that, what to- I was going to get on to the, the uh, McDonald, and this is where I heard about how McDonald had, had shot himself and had committed suicide. And, uh, and, and this was, you know, it had just happened. And Heineck, I guess, was one of the first people to find out. And he told us, and I told Phil Class, and Class hadn't heard about it yet. But he, so he'd had, uh, um, you know, some dealings with uh, McDonald, although on a, you know, a, on a less than uh, real friendly way. Yes. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that was a tragedy. But, uh, you know, uh, what's your name? Ann Druffel 
uh, I guess the late, I believe she just died recently. She was in her 90s, I think. A, a MUFON, well known MUFON investigator. She wrote a book on uh, James McDonald called Firestorm, and uh, in which she, she goes in, uh, she interviewed everybody. She interviewed class, she interviewed all the members of his family, whatever. And she, you know, some people had said, well, class was such a nasty guy that he drove poor Dr. McDonald to suicide. Uh, and of course, that's not true at all, that he was having very serious problems uh, at home. His wife was leaving him and he was just absolutely distraught over that. And as, as you know, reading Ann Druffel's book, there's no doubt that it was, you know, his wife leaving him that triggered him to be suicidal. Um, yeah, you mentioned about this committee that uh, Gerald Ford was on, the Roush uh, Commission. So if, if people want to Google Roush, um, he was the um, one that uh, the, the, the House lead, I guess, on that committee. Um, yeah, okay, so eventually you, you graduated from Northwestern mathematics uh, degree, right. and, uh, and then you moved to Washington, D.C. Is that a coincidence that Philip Class was here? Um, no, it's not a coincidence because um, I, well, I grew up in Chicago, and uh, for a number of reasons, I didn't like it. The weather was the biggest reason. <laughs> and uh, uh, also, where I was, there wasn't much going on. I guess if you live downtown or something, there'd be more things. But uh, I had visited D.C. a couple of times uh, uh, and visited with Glass while I was there. And in fact, several times I stayed in his apartment. <laughs> and uh, th then it, um, I decided, you know, I, I, was, I got a teaching degree and I was going to teach math. And so I decided I would, I would teach math in the DC area rather than uh, in Chicago. So I got, uh, I taught for a while with the Arlington schools uh, in uh, like junior high and uh, middle school. And I decided, uh, no, I don't want to do this. And at that time, the computer industry was uh, very much booming and looking for people. And there was no such thing as a computer science degree in those days. Uh, but there were people who had studied programming. In those days, programming meant Fortran, and if you were really advanced, it might mean Elgo. And uh, there was engineering degrees. People, you know, if somebody, if somebody, we would say now somebody studied computer science, but in those days, they, well, you got a degree in engineering, you studied computers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so basically, anybody with a math degree, physics, chemistry, you'd go in these, you know, company, high-tech companies would, uh, including when you and I spoke earlier, we mentioned uh, Computer Sciences Corporation. That yeah. wasn't my first job. I think it was my second job in the industry. But uh, basically these companies were looking, uh, the, the qualification was basically have a BA in either math or science or physics, chemistry, and we'll hire you is basically <laughs> what it was. And so that's what I did. Yeah, your story is very similar to mine, by the way. Uh, yeah. You worked at Computer Sciences Corporation uh, at, at Goddard Space Flight Center for a time. And well, not at, directly. I, I, w I went out there sometimes, but the office was uh, 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 on Rig Riggs Road there, Hyattsville. They had an office that was off the site. It's a few miles from Goddard, but I did go out to Goddard, but it was not like an everyday thing. It was... Uh, mm -hmm go out when I needed to go out to do something. And after you left, uh, I, by coincidence, I joined the CSC uh, 1990 uh, and worked at Goddard. Uh, uh, but um, th there was no overlap between our time no. at that company. Um, yeah, so um, you, you moved, uh, I guess, from Virginia up to Maryland at some point. Right. And um, it, as we discussed before this, um, you were uh, three blocks from my house, and I wish I had known that. I was in high school at the time. I was very curious about UFOs and other things. And if I'd known, hey, there's a, a UFO investigator in your neighborhood, and he has answers to your questions, I would have been thrilled. But unfortunately, that 1977 to 1980 time period, you were secretly in my neighborhood. I didn't even know about Skeptical Inquirer that... Uh, it was another 10 years, 1986 uh, was when I first found out about. I want to say real quick, Skeptical Inquirer is still being published. I highly recommend that people read it. And, um, you know, it's, it's a great resource for these topics where the news media goes sensational and Skeptical Inquirer is fact evidence based. And uh, 
you wrote for that for 40 years regularly, uh, you know, each issue, and you were living in my neighborhood. And how did you get uh, connected with uh, the committee for what's now called the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, which publishes uh, Skeptical Inquirer magazine? Used to be called PSYCOP. Mm-hmm. Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. And frankly, I wish it stayed with the paranormal instead of getting into all the other stuff they're getting into now. Right. But, uh, well, Phil Class, you see, was one of the original founders. The committee yes, was founded in 1976. Mm-hmm. And um, they had some meeting in Buffalo or New York or someplace in New York City. I don't remember where it was. But uh, Paul Kurtz, the philosopher, uh, organized the whole thing. Yes. He was. Um, uh, he had previously been uh, the president. At the time, I think he still was the president of the American Humanist Association. Yes, and then Marcello Truzzi was the other guy who joined it. Was a psychologist from Eastern Michigan University. Truzzi was an interesting character. He was a very strange sort of a guy. Uh, a very jovial. Uh, I really liked the guy. He was a little more of what should we say is soft skeptic. I guess he was more like Heineck. Uh, uh, Truth, it was the sort of guy who could never come to any firm conclusion about anything. You know, it must be this, it might be that. Uh, and there were a number of other people uh, who were there for this thing. I think I, I, I think Sagan was there at the beginning. Right. Carl Sagan. Our, Isaac Asimov and so on. I only met him once at a, at a psychop meeting, Asimov. He almost never actually participated and it was all kinds of others you can look it up in the you know in the old james uh, randy the amazing randy, randy. Uh, i met yeah, randy got to know him pretty well and uh, the, i wasn't there for this meeting uh in fact i didn't even hear about it in advance glass didn't mention it uh, or maybe it just came up quickly so he was up there and then they found it they you know they they all signed this declaration supporting reason and skepticism and whatever and uh so uh you know, then I, and this was in the, all the papers, you know, even the, you know, the big papers, New York Times, Washington Post, and so on, even it was just a small little thing, it was, you know, scientists make a, uh, you know, a committee to, to scientifically examine claims of astrology and psychics and UFOs and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. So then they had a number of meetings, uh, and they didn't have any conferences yet as such. They were basically press conferences. Uh, but I was able to attend several of them, and I even had one in uh, D.C., one or two in D.C., and uh, there were several in uh, Washington or in, in Manhattan. I, I think it was 77, so the, the group was only like a year old, and I went up uh, to Manhattan where they were having a uh, press conference, and that's where I met Randy, I met Paul Kurtz, class was there. Martin Gardner was there. I had lunch with Martin Gardner. So, I mean, Excellent. you know, all these. And I did uh, take a number of pictures. And some of these are, um, oh, gosh, I, I, a few of them might be on my blog, not too many. Uh, when I get around to writing more on this stuff, I'll have to publish some of these. Yep. But I sent them in to Barry Carr at the uh, Psychop. And uh, I think they've, they've used a few of them in some of their mm-hmm. you know, you know, yeah, right so um, I, I wanted to ask you this at the end, but I'll ask you now. Uh, have you thought about writing memoirs? <laughs> well, uh, sort of, yeah. We'll see what uh, what comes. But, you know, skeptic history is, well, who is, uh, I guess, Daniel Luxton, uh, you know, Skeptic Magazine has been kind of uh, following up on the skeptic history end of it. And uh, uh, I I will I will have more to write, but uh, I'm not sure exactly when and exactly in what mm-hmm. form. Yeah, um, and for those who are wondering why is a magician with this group, they're great at uh, detecting psychic uh, tricks. So uh, psychics use magic tricks, and you know, good magicians, uh, you know, friendly um, non uh, fraudsters recognize their tricks that these con men uh, use against uh, unwitting victims. So uh, James Randi has exposed many uh, psychics uh, oh, yeah. for their tricks. Um, yeah, and you mentioned Carl Sagan. He was also, um, th- these are names that a lot of folks uh, recognize immediately from this group. And uh, somehow you were able to get this regular column going. And uh, do you remember how that started? 
Well, yeah, I, I proposed it to Kendrick Frazier, who was a longtime editor. In fact, I think he still is the editor of uh, Skeptical Inquirer. He was there at that first meeting I went to in 1977. He had previously been the editor of, was it Science News or something like that? And uh, so he was doing this basically full time, or maybe not full time, but, but half time at least, the, uh, you know, the editing and, uh, of the publication. And uh, so I proposed it to him and, uh, and he liked it. And I started doing that. At first it was gonna be, I thought, well, other people could contribute to it as well. And class did contribute one or two uh, little pieces, but I guess nobody else did. So I said, all right, this is my column then. And oh. I started to write it. And actually I have written um, a book I have published. Now this is not the complete, um, but uh, I, I psychic vibrations. Oops, I see. We can see this on the uh, oh, yes. camera there. Okay, and uh, you can get this on Amazon. It's it's the first like the first twenty years of columns, and maybe someday I'll get around to doing the second twenty years uh, in another volume. But uh, I haven't done that. Yet. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, um, uh, you know, uh, you, you being in the Washington area. Uh, occasionally at Goddard Space Flight Center. I wasn't sure if you knew this, but the real life exorcist child uh, was a, a, an employee at Goddard Space Flight Center when he grew up in, in real life. It was a boy, not a girl as it right, was. Right, right, I remember uh, that. Movie and novel. And uh, he retired about 20 years ago. He <laughs> passed away about two years ago. And if people want to Google that, Ronald Hunkeler, H-U-N-K-E-L-E-R, a chemist, a, um, a ceramics expert at Goddard from the 60s to the early 2000s. Anyway, it sounds like you already knew this. I, I'd heard about that a little bit. Now, another one, I didn't know if you heard about this. There was a guy who discovered dinosaur tracks out there at Goddard. I'm oh, yes, Ray Stanford. Ray Stanford. And you know who Ray Stanford is? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. He's one of these far out UFO guys. He and his twin brother, I forget the brother's name, uh, they've had to say he's a psychic. He does all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it's amazing to me, as you said, he's pretty far out, but he's oh, yeah. also close in when it comes to dinosaur finds, <laughs> yeah, yeah. where the, the the experts are like, "Hey, this guy knows what he's doing," and so on. And so he's got sort of a part of him that isn't terribly uh, helpful to the scientific community. In fact, <laughs> perhaps anti-helpful, and then extremely helpful in this other area. Yeah, well, apparently he had a whole group and everything. I forget what it was called, but it was like a new age group and they were really into psychic powers and channeling right. and all that stuff. Yeah, so, Google Ray Stanford, just like the university, yeah, and yeah. learn more about this fascinating character. I've met him a few times at Goddard when he's given talks, including about this uh, dinosaur track he found uh, several years ago. Unfortunately, it's not on public display. It's in building 30 three at Goddard. And it's Inside like, the building or outside? It's, the, it's, a, it's a, a cast. It's a, a, a oh, copy no. of it, but it, oh, at okay. least it, it maybe the real one should be on public display at the visitor center, in my opinion, but I wasn't. Yeah, I think it. so. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, um, so during this period, you're working uh, here in the Washington area and you're um, writing for the Skeptical Inquirer. And you're also writing your first book, isn't that right? Yeah, it was uh, first published, I think, in 81. It was a UFO verdict was the title. Yes. Uh, it's largely the same book as uh, UFO Sightings, which was about, oh, almost 20 years later. But um, I revised it pretty thoroughly. I added a couple chapters and, you know, every case that was discussed there uh, in the in the original version, I if there was any follow up information, I added the follow up information. Mm -hmm. So I, it's I, it's completely up to date at the time it was published. I, I definitely want to get into the nitty gritty of a couple of cases in particular. Um, but to to finish up about class, you were living in the Washington D.C. Right. area, and so there were at least two. Uh, preeminent skeptics at that time in the D.C. area. Was there any sort of 
I don't know, get togethers or, hey, let's maybe form a group. It's too early for that. I think that concept, but I was wondering if any of you had thought about, you know what, if we form well, a- We used to hang out with, uh, you know who Gary Posner is? Oh yes. Uh, he lives in Florida now. He used to live in Baltimore and uh, he was a skeptic also. Uh, he had, a, I guess, a background when he was a youngster with MUFON. Uh, and then he realized that, well, this is not really a very scientific approach to anything. And he became a skeptic. And he used to come into town and hang out with us, with Phil Class and I. Uh, and then this other fellow, Michael Dennett, the late Michael Dennett, uh, who he used to write also for um, Skeptical Inquirer. He later moved out to uh, Seattle and worked for Boeing. And uh, but he, he so since he was out there, he started specialized in you know Bigfoot sightings and such. And he was investigating some of these. And mm -hmm. You'll find articles by Michael Dennett in the Skeptical Inquirer, mm -hmm. uh, and he sure. died uh, a while ago. I see. Um, before we move on from Phil Class, um, I did want to kind of wrap up about him. Um, what was your impression of him, his strengths and weaknesses, um, personally, and so on? He was mentored. Yeah. Well, he he was what you might colloquially describe as a hard ass, <laughs> and he could yeah. be a very difficult guy to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes some very small little thing might get him upset, which I thought was, you know, very much an overreaction. Mm -hmm. But uh, but he was completely honest. People say, oh well, he was a disinformation agent or whatever and this is nonsense mm -hmm. uh, they say oh he knew that you know the cia and he worked with the cia or something no he uh he worked for aviation week in space technology magazine mm -hmm. sometimes known as aviation leak because <laughs> they were the first to you know to publish about certain weapon systems and certain projects that the government wishes that had not been reported on in fact i understand at one time you know, you know, they have, well, now they have FBI files on everybody, or at least on the, on the people who are no longer living, and you can, you can get them on the FBI website. And there's a FBI papers on Phil Glass. Yes. And one of the things that they talk about was that um, he, uh, they were at least considering prosecuting him for, for something he published, having nothing to do with UFOs. It was some, you know, weapon system or aircraft or something that was supposed to be secret, but he got some people to leak, to leak it and he published this and they weren't happy about that, but they decided it would do more, it would leak more secrets if they had to bring him to trial. So they, <laughs> they left it at that. And no, he was completely loyal. I mean, in the sense that, you know, he wasn't trying to undermine the government or anything. And, you know, he, uh, he was he was very much a straight arrow kind of guy as far as that goes. He knew a lot of people. He knew a number of congressmen and, and cabinet ministers, cabinet officials and whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah. And he actually, and he knew, of course, uh, they said, one of the things that it said there and other people have said was, yeah, he was friends with this guy from the Russian embassy. And that was true because I, I also met that guy. In fact, I think we went sailing with... Uh, him one day because class had a sailboat on the Potomac and uh, uh, but it was kind of like these two guys were trying to get information from each other you know it's huh. what it was they were hanging the Russian was hanging around with Phil hope he might you know say something and Phil was hoping that the Russian guy might say something and so, mm -hmm. but uh, essentially you know, nothing ever came of that I, I'm mm -hmm. quite sure but you know but you know some people will make a big conspiracy out of it and uh whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to include um, uh, a couple of impressions I had. Uh, I certainly didn't uh, know him as well as you. I only met him several times, uh, probably talked a, a total of a half hour with him. Mm -hmm. But uh, here's what I wrote about first meeting him. Uh, this was 35 years ago this week, as I described at the beginning. As class approached, I recognized him immediately from his book jacket photos. But I was surprised that he wasn't as tall as I expected. Yet he impressed with a sharp looking gray suit topped off with a fedora. Yep. He was smoking a cigarette and reminded me of Always. someone out of an old film noir. I think yes. he was still of the time when men wore suits almost every day. My friend they wore was suits right. and wore hats like that. Both exactly. hats every day. Yes, yes. that's right. And uh, um, 
it, it turned out that was a very busy time for him, the spring of 1987. Uh, a lot of things happened in the UFO world uh, within just a matter of weeks. He was on um, Oprah Winfrey show in May. Uh, that was when the concept of people being abducted from their homes and uh, being having to be hypnotized to, to, re, to learn that they had been um, abducted um, oh, yep. was, was all the rage. And so Oprah had Phil Class on as a skeptic and she had Bud Hopkins, uh, an artist right. turned into hypnotist um, who is recovering memories of these alleged abductees. And this was something I really liked about Class um, that in, in terms of his rubber meets the road type of reasoning as you might expect from a journalist, uh, an investigator. Yep. So his idea was, if what you say, Bud Hopkins, say is true, then this other thing must consequentially be true. For example, Bud Hopkins and others were publicly claiming that people were being abducted by extraterrestrials. And Class pointed out, this would be a federal crime and the FBI should be notified. And Hopkins replied, that's absurd. Why would how could the FBI do anything against ETs? And class, <laughs> class said on, on Oprah Winfrey's show, I don't know, let's find out. And so yeah. Class, as you know, he offered $10,000 if an abduction is reported to the FBI and the latter, you know, the FBI confirms that it actually occurred. But he did <laughs> warn folks, hey, the FBI fines people $10,000 and up to five years in prison if the FBI determines determines that a reported abduction is spurious. And of course, it, it turned out later, Hopkins did sort of report it to the FBI, but he used extremely tentative language. It's like, it's almost as if he didn't really believe these cases could be real. And he was trying to kind of toe the line there. And I, I thought that was a great use of his, uh, you know, rubber meets the road kind of thinking uh, that it's like put your money where your mouth is. Type. Yeah, that was one of his favorite crazies. Put your money where your mouth is. Yes. Um, and so I mentioned about the abductions. And then just yeah. a couple weeks later, um, he's on Nightline with Ted Koppel. Right. And it turns out that um, these so called government documents had come to light. Uh, oh, MJ12. Yeah. Right. If yeah, people want to yeah. Google MJ12, they can learn all about this. Again, you know, the, the, the beauty of my talking to you today is that people can Google the details and I want to get you to say and think things you've never thought publicly before. That was sort of my goal here is to fill in gaps in your earlier interviews and writings. And I, I, I think we're sort of on track here. I, I'm, I'm kind of thrilled. But um, uh, MJ12 and, and class was terrific in doing his investigation and finding that uh, this alleged memo that President Truman signed showing that this uh, he was giving authorization for this secret uh, government group with top scientists and so on to study crashed UFOs. It's, it turns out it's a photocopy of Truman's signature from another, a genuine memo. And there's forensic evidence to support this. Uh, and it was just beautiful work. Um, right. Yeah. So yeah, that these was are the things thing. I think of when I think of class. Is his greatest yes, yeah. yeah. That was a big thing. The so-called MJ12. Uh, Stanton Friedman was behind this, and Bill Moore and uh, Jamie Shandera, and uh, it was you know for a while this was a real big thing, and uh, then that's I guess you know. So, I guess uh, there's still a lot of people who think it's true, I guess, but I think, you know, a reasonable person could see now it was a fake for some of the reasons that you mentioned. There were other reasons too. Class compared like the text in the, the so-called MJ-12 documents to some letters that uh, Bill Moore had written that <laughs> found some amazing, you know, uh, you know, coincidences in terms of phrasing and in terms of, you know, how he wrote the date and everything yes, like that. Bill, so, yeah. William Moore used an unusual date format when writing out, you know, the year, month, day. And it's almost never seen in genuine, uh, you know, yeah. government documents, but it was in this what's almost certainly hoaxed documents yeah. that were somehow slipped into government uh, 
boxes government uh, files. And uh, it's a remarkable case. Again, Google will answer many questions for the curious. Yeah, I have some of that in uh, in my books. I can't remember which chapters exactly deal with it, but I've, you know, I've, I've written about that. Also, if you look on my blog, uh, it has a little um, uh, ch- uh, a search box up at the top <laughs> where you can have it search uh, for something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, MJ-12 I'm, or whatever. Mm-hmm. I, I mentioned <laughs> in my opening uh, that skeptics follow evidence wherever it may lead, even if you don't like where it's going. And it seems to me Class did that. He originally had the hypothesis you mentioned about these plasma UFOs. Yeah. In fact, he wrote a whole book about it in the 60s That's called right. UFOs Identified, as you mentioned. Right. But that book is kind of forgotten because the hypothesis ju- just didn't work and he left it behind. He, he, his, his next book, UFOs Explained. Yeah, was, mostly is, all hoaxes. Yeah. That's right, this, that's, still yes, that's, that's still a classic. That still holds up today. Um, and so it, 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 he's, the, he's an excellent skeptic in terms of leaving behind the, the, the hypothesis that doesn't fit the facts. So I, I think of him in that way as well. Um, I did want to ask you, it, my experience with class was he was a very funny guy. Yeah. And uh, it, it, am I correct uh, it, it, when you interacted with him? He had sort of an irascible kind of humor and it would come out not in his professional writings uh, or even for Skeptical Inquirer, but his uh, newsletter that he started publishing in uh, the yes. late eighties, Skeptics UFO newsletter. So S U N, and uh, you, you'd see, you know, kind of uh, wink, uh, but but still very useful. And, and yeah, it's online, and actually, a lot of it is very very useful because he followed up on on so many things and so many of these claims, not just uh, MJ twelve, but you know, abduction claims. Uh, uh, you know, around this time you're talking about uh, with the Bud Hopkins and then these abductions, they had an abduction study conference at MIT. And this was 1992. And they invited Phil Glass to go because the, it was organized by Hopkins, Jacobs, and Mack, okay, who I call the triumvirate of the UFO abductionists because during their heyday, they were, you know, they were they were where it's at as far as UFO abductions and the media was all over them. And all this is all very scientific. They thought they had such a good case, not just one case, but so many good cases. They were ready to basically go to prime time to meet all the skeptics and to present their evidence. And their one very best case was this woman, Linda, levitated Linda, who was abducted from her from her apartment in Manhattan, out the window or something to a UFO hovering over the Brooklyn Bridge. This was called for a while, this was called the Brooklyn Bridge abduction. Yes. And then they realized that w- w- didn't have the right connotation to it. But although I, I think actually it did. And then it turned out that this woman was just spinning all kinds of tales. So and far uh, out, I, I think, yeah. you know. But, um, but the point is, this is what these guys, Hopkins, Jacobs, and Mac. They thought here was the case that is so solid that the skeptics are just going to be blown apart, and uh, we have established our case, you know, beyond any uh, doubt. And uh, but even a number of the UFO believers who were, you know, okay, they were willing to believe it if there was good evidence, and they started to look into it, and you know, there was not good evidence. In fact, there's really bad evidence. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you know who Carol Rainey is. Uh, she uh, was the divorced. Uh, she was uh, she was married to Bud Hopkins, and I guess they were divorced before he died. She has written a number of things, and I have links to them. I think on my blog and so on. Mm-hmm. Carol Rainey, R A I N E Y, and okay. basically what she says is, my husband Bud knew that this woman Linda was making shit up. He <laughs> knew it, and she knew it. Wow. But he would not admit it publicly. And in public, he always said, oh, her, her testimony is so, uh, you know, beyond uh, any dispute. She's so reliable. And he knew this was false, but he said it anyway. So wow. and you got to stand up. You got to you got to admire her for standing up and saying that. 
Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned about your bad UFOs blog. Uh, we'll uh, put yeah. that in the comments. It carries on, I think, the tradition of Classes Skeptics UFO newsletter. You're getting topical uh, commentary, uh, news updates, and so on. It's uh, anyone who's fascinated by UFO claims, you know, interested. There it is for you. Uh, you're you're maintaining that, uh, you know, providing updates just like Class did in the. 80s and 90s and even into the early 2000s before he passed away. Um, by the way, you mentioned about looking at Skeptics UFO newsletter are, are you know those those copies online. You'll see that he used italics, underlines, bold font, all caps, and it almost it almost looked like a crank letter. Yeah, you know, I'm sure all, you got all his letters are like that. If he would send you a letter, he would have be using italics and capital and everything like that to emphasize things. Yeah, so, isn't yeah. that funny? It, that was uh, pure class. Yes, uh, yeah. it, 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 it's just one of those things where it's like the, the guy's great at um, you know exposing things, investigating, but his his use of fonts could have gotten some <laughs> refinement, I guess. Um, by the way, well, he before, didn't have an editor. What's that? I say he didn't have an editor, yeah. at least most of the time. Um, yeah, but well, certainly, yeah. in fact, he was an editor at uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology Magazine. And yeah, I, but not a copy editor. That's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> um, by the way, before we move on from class, I think we're kind of wrapping up with his part of your story. I want to point out that there is not just one, but two awards given in his name, one by his former employer, Aviation Week and Space Technology Magazine. Um, and uh, that's for lifetime achievement. So if people want to Google this, um, you'll see, you know, uh, astronauts, um, CEOs of aerospace corporations, the inventor of the aircraft stall warning device. Wow, you know that's oh. that's a significant thing. So um, his, uh, you know, the, the director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory received a Philip J. Class Award for lifetime achievement. So even to this day, he's been dead for over fifteen years, and Aviation yeah. Week is continuing to honor his memory uh, in the profession. Right. And then, well, as I mentioned, our group, National Capital Area Skeptics, also presents a Philip J. Class Award uh, for outstanding contributions in critical thinking and scientific understanding. So for instance, James Randi, you mentioned him, he got one. A reporter at Washington Post who's done good work uh, covering uh, you know, paranormal and science, uh, Joel Achenbach, Penn and Teller for yeah. um, you know, getting the word out about uh, skeptical um, perspectives, you know, how psychics mislead people and so on. John Mather, uh, the uh, astrophysicist, Nor Nobel laureate uh, uh, with the Webb telescope that just launched. It's like, well, he, he, in addition to doing that, he's wonderful at, at telling the public about what that's all about. And uh, that's why he got the award. And our newest one, as I mentioned, uh, near the end of this month, Susan Gerbic, who's um, you know, kept Wikipedia uh, and, and will keep Wikipedia um, accurate regarding you know, science and pseudoscience topics. Uh, and so um, we'll be celebrating her uh, accomplishments with the um, 2022 uh, edition of the Philip J. Class Award. Uh, from yes, the I know Susan. Yeah, she's done some uh, really fine work uh, with uh, mm -hmm. challenging um, some of the things people are writing. Um, I wanted to mention about Glass. He was an electrical engineer. He was yes. not. He was not an, a, an aviation engineer or anything like that. Or aerospace. His degree was in electrical engineering, and yes, his specialty was in avionics or aviation electronics. In fact, I. They claim. They say that Glass invented the word avionics. Just you know, as a as a contraction of aviation electronics. Yes, um, I'll close with. His curse, which he premiered uh, about 20 years before he died. And again, yes. the, the whimsy comes through here. I'll read it uh, from the website. The last will and testament of Philip J. Class to ufologists who publicly criticize me or even think unkind thoughts about me in <laughs> private. I do hereby leave and bequeath the UFO curse. And again, he's using, you know, some capital uh, fonts here. No matter how long you live, you will never know any more about UFOs than you know today. 
You will never know any more about what UFOs really are or where they come from. You will never know any more about what the US government really knows about UFOs than you know today. As you lie on your own deathbed, you will be as mystified about UFOs as you are today, and you will remember this curse. That's right. I think it's holding up. What do you, what do you Absolutely, think about Absolutely, because, you know, and this business we're seeing now with all the Pentagon UFO claims and so on, you know, most of these people who are getting so excited about that have very little background or uh, times in ufology or ufology, if you want to call it that. This mm -hmm. is, we're just, this is just a repeat of uh, what happened in the 1950s and 60s, that in the 19, late 40s, 50s sightings started to pile in. Now Air Force said, well, we got to investigate this. This might be something important. And of course, nothing happened. And then more sightings just came in. And But, you know, no matter how dramatic a UFO is, it always manages to escape. It always gets away before the evidence becomes too convincing. And so the, the whole business of the Condon Report was the Air Force finally said, all right, we're done with this. We're going to let these guys at the University of Colorado figure out what it is, and then we'll just, you know, uh, go along with whatever they say. And they said, uh, basically, you know, there isn't anything really going on here. Uh, can't say for certain, but there's no evidence of anything extraordinary. And so then the Air Force said, all right, that's it, we're done. <laughs> but then this stuff just kind of starts again. It's almost like a cycle. It builds and builds. Because these people aren't old enough or haven't been in ufology long enough to remember the excitement of the 50s and the, the NICAP in the sure. 60s and then the Condon Report. They, they don't know about this. Sure. And now they say, well, we need to have congressional hearings. We had congressional hearings in 1968. What happened? Nothing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, well, listen, um, uh, we, we have about a half hour left, I think. Um, uh, the, you were still in the Washington area until the early 1980s. And before you left, you um, uh, participated in a symposium at the Smithsonian about UFOs. Um, yes. What do you remember about that? Well, there were a number of people uh, who, let's see, they had three people who were on the pro-UFO side. Uh, and I think three who are on the skeptic side, myself and class and uh, Jim Oberg. And I'm trying to remember now, it was, it was uh, Heineck and I think it was Ellen Hendry and Bruce McAbee on uh, the other side, on the pro side. Uh, Bruce McAbee is still around and uh, still writing things from time to time. Okay. Ellen Hendry, like I said, has disappeared and will have nothing to do with UFOs any longer. And uh, of course, Heineck died in 1986 or something like that. So it's been a while. And, um, it was, or, it, it was organized by Fred Durant, who was, uh, he was, again, going back to one of these committees, if, what was the one tonight, the CIA, the Robertson panel, uh, that, uh, in fact, it, it, this, again, <laughs> that was almost like the uh, Compton Report, except that it was much earlier, and it was secret at that time, it was, I think it was January of 53, because okay. 52 had been an exceptional year in terms of sightings, that was a year of all the excitement about UFOs over Washington, and uh, you know they're getting radar returns that didn't you know go anywhere. You know you see something on the radar and then it would disappear. All oh, UFOs, well, no radar propagation. You know uh, it, it's not you know just because something turns up, especially on those older radars. In fact, Class wrote something pointing out that almost all of these um, you know big radar cases took place before a certain year, I forget what it was, when news radar systems went into widespread use. And uh, <coughs> so then uh, the problem got much better. But in 53, they had a secret CIA panel. Yes, I've suggested people Google Robertson panel to learn yeah. more about this. Um, <laughs> and it was secret at the time, although they released it about 10 or 15 years later. Uh -huh. Heineck was a member of that panel, though. He said he was the junior member and he didn't want to speak up. He didn't agree with them, but they were debunking. And, you know, I was yeah. the young, yeah, but, and, and, you know, in class said that. And I said, you know, Phil, uh, he was, uh, Heineck was just a young boy of 43 at this time. You know, of course he felt, uh, <laughs> you know, like he, he didn't belong with all these. Uh, Dr. Robertson was somebody important from Caltech or something and uh, physicist and, uh, 
Fred Durant was the uh, recording secretary. And I think Fred Durant just died recently. And he was, he was I think, almost 100 years old. Okay. <laughs> he was a good buddy of Tell Class. And I met him several times. And, and he was a skeptic. But he wanted to, you know, organize the Smithsonian thing. Uh, actually, if you look at my, uh, I do have another site called uh, debunker.com. And this is mostly older stuff. The new stuff about UFOs I put on uh, bad UFOs. This is more stuff of a, of a more general interest and more historical interest. And I have a page called historical on uh, debunker.com that basically has a lot of this old stuff. I have letters from Phil Class. And uh, he wrote what he called white papers, are basically like preprints. Yes. I have a number of his white papers on there. And I have a copy. Of, <coughs> excuse me, I've been having a problem with uh, sore throat lately. Yes. And that oh. was uh, my talk to the Smithsonian is on that page. So if you want to read Excellent. That, okay. Um, what it says. Yeah, you, you mentioned about Bruce Maccabee, uh, yeah. a physicist, an optical physicist at the Naval Surface Warfare Center uh, in White Oak, Maryland, and, and considered the most technically competent uh, UFO investigator. Um, he and uh, class were actually our first NCAS event. So this is June of 1987, <coughs> almost 35 years ago. And the topic was uh, UFO abductions, fact or fiction. And Maccabee went first. And it turned out he completely changed gears. And he said, well, to understand abductions, you need to look at the history of cases. So he sh sort of showed mild, you know, sightings uh, cases. And then when uh, class's turn came, he said, I want to apologize to everyone who came here expecting a debate about UFO abductions. And you didn't hear about UFO abductions from Bruce McAbee. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so he says, I, I don't have those files with me, but I will tell you what my prepared remarks were. Anyway, I talked to him after the event and he said, I was just on the phone with Bruce McAbee, you know, last week. And he could have said, Phil, you know what? I'm having second thoughts. Let's just talk about classic cases. And he said, that, son that SOB did mm -hmm. not tell me. And so it, you know, it did look like Maccabee was simply getting cold feet and avoiding the uh, controversial topic. And um, so anyway, that was um, uh, my my most vivid Maccabee uh, memory from uh, that. Well, he time. wrote that, if you recall, uh, this guy in Gulf Breeze, Florida, uh, who originally he was, he was going to be anonymous. They just called him Ed, or we called him Mr. Ed, because that was the talking horse, if you remember yes. on TV. And, uh, but then he later, he came out in public, and he was Ed Walters, and he was a well-known member of his community. He was a contractor or some such thing. And he had these preposterous UFO photos that he supposedly had taken of, uh, you know, uh, you know, objects hovering around his house and whatever. And uh, mm -hmm. they were, they were, they were really bad now, but it, it, it established like a, a mini cottage industry in uh, that area. People seeing UFOs, there was a place where they would go uh, at, at the river, the mouth of a river nearby there and they would watch UFOs uh, there. Bruce Ma Ed Walters wrote a book. I forget what the title of it was, but it was, you know, his crazy UFO claims. And Bruce Maccabee wrote the foreword or introduction or whatever to that book that basically yes. says, yes, what everything Ed Walters says is true. Wow. And, uh, it's, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I knew Maccabee because, you know, we used to hang out. In fact, we used to do astronomy together sometimes. We'd go out okay. to places that were not too far away, but darker than in Silver Spring. And because he was living in Silver Spring at that time. Okay. And, um, you know, take our telescopes out there and look at stuff. And that was good fun. Um, but, uh, you know, and his, his analysis like of the, uh, the Trent photos where he said, well, he thinks they're at a, at a distance. Uh, and he, he basically confirmed what, uh, you know, the, the seeming anomaly was from uh, the Condon report from uh, William Hartman's investigation. Awesome. And, uh, but uh, it turns out that, well, there's other ways to interpret that. That the one interpretation is that the underside of the object is brighter because of um, 
you know, it's at a distance, the scattering of light at a, at a long distance. Yes. You know, it's, it's almost like the sky background. Uh, that's one interpretation you can make. I pointed out you can make another one having to do with what they call veiling glare, basically like grease on the lens. Sometimes I notice my cell phone that I put in my pocket, when I take it out without realizing that I put my thumb on the lens and I go take a picture and it's all gray and smudged and I wipe it off and then it's, it's better. Yes. But uh, it, the same thing is true of any lens, uh, any camera lens. And if it was a little bit, uh, you know, uh, smudged, it, it, it could cause this. Yes. But then Bruce did some other measurements and somehow came up with the, the no veiling glare was not sufficient to explain this. Then Joel Carpenter, um, the late Joel Carpenter, had uh, a site where he was looking into this and he found that uh, there's a very good uh, match for the Trent photos as, uh, as an old truck mirror from the 1930s that if you just had a, a you know, a, a cord or fishing line or something and you sprung this thing on there, mm-hmm. this would explain a lot of the, this would explain the anomaly because it's the assumption the assumption is this is the underside of the object is dark because it's uh, you know it's shaded from sunlight. Uh, but if the underside of the object is in fact a mirror, then it's reflecting the bright ground, and that's why it's brighter than it seems to be. And that's, that all makes perfect sense. And I have that on my. If you look at my historical page, uh, I have some links, or do I have a, actually I have a separate page for Trent. Uh, it might also be on the historical page, but you know, look there on uh, thebunker.com, and yeah. you'll find you'll find that, a lot of information about that. that. That was one of the two historical cases. So you know, today's event is UFOs, then, now, and next. So then <laughs> being uh, the Trent case, and I've suggested people you know Google Trent UFO 1950 to learn more about that. Mm -hmm. And then another case that I'm just about to bring up, but as you said, the University of Colorado scientific study initially found these photos to be remarkable. Um, and uh, yeah, well, he found it an anomaly and he couldn't That's explain right. it. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And uh, actually, a, a noted scientist in his youth was the lead investigator, William Hartman. Right. If you look, he's, he's one of the developers of the uh, accepted theory that the moon was formed by uh, an early proto planet hitting uh, Earth. And, and the out come of that was the formation of the moon. So he's, he's not just an average uh, uh, investigator, a scientific investigator. Anyway, um, when, when you investigated the case and showed him the evidence, he agreed it's almost certainly a hoax in terms of your analysis of what yeah. time of day it actually occurred. Right. The, the shadows on the side of the building. Right. Another investigator saw suspicious looking, it almost looked like maybe something was tied to the uh, telephone line above the UFO. Yes, yes. So th- this all was coming together as much less um, uh, impressive um, than initially uh, believed. Um, I did want to go to the other historical one that was quite, um, um, you know, caused a splash. And uh, you were an investigator, really the lead on that, uh, before he became a governor of Georgia and before he became president of the United States, Jimmy Carter in early 1969 saw a UFO and he reported it some years, like four years later. Um, would you talk about your, your work on that? Right. Well, at this time, um, let's see, 1980, when Jimmy Carter was running for president, um, he somehow he was with a group of reporters and somehow the subject of UFOs came up and he said, well, I don't think I don't laugh at people when they say they've seen a UFO because I've seen one like that myself. Uh-huh. And so they asked him a little bit. And he didn't say much because he didn't remember. Like he thought it had to do with. He thought it was in 1968, uh, but he, he but he couldn't remember the date or anything. He said was when I went to Leary, Georgia, to give a talk to the Lions Club because he was Carter was at that time in 1968, 69. He was a local. He was a, an official of the local Lions Club in Georgia, uh-huh. and uh, his job involved going around to different branches and different chapters uh, and to give a little talk, a little pep talk, whatever. 
And, uh, but he said like, before the thing started, we were standing out and we saw this thing and it, uh, you know, and it was bright and it was unusual and it was remarkable and we didn't know what it was. So, and then they went in to, to do the talk, uh, but almost no detail. And he, then somehow the um, National Enquirer did a story on it and they put it in, uh, I forget the town they put it in. It turned out that wasn't right at all. Uh, and then I got more information from, uh, it turns out that Carter reported it, but it was only because um, somebody um, from, what was the name of this group uh, in Oklahoma City, the, um, I can't think of the group right now, but when he heard about Carter say this, he sent a letter to Jimmy Carter at the Georgia Capitol, state Capitol, and asked, would you please fill out this information? It was just basically it's a citing report form. Yes. And, uh, and I have that on my, my, my page, on my, on my debunker.com. There's a separate page for mm-hmm. the Carter UFO. And, uh, and established the location was Leary, Georgia. It was not the town that the National Enquirer said it was. Right. Uh, but he still didn't remember the exact date or anything like that. Um, but I decided to see if I could get more information. So I contacted the headquarters of the... Uh, of the Lions Club, which was in uh, Illinois, in suburban Chicago, and uh, they went looking for it, and uh, I spoke with them a bit later, and they, they found it, and uh, basically, he just filed a small report that said, I went to Leary, Georgia, on January the 6th of 1969 to give this talk, and whatever, whatever. And basically, there, there wasn't anything about UFOs or anything on there, which is a very uh, you know, simple thing, but that's very important because it gave us the exact date. And uh, uh-huh. that if you're going to investigate any kind of UFO sighting, you have to have the, the exact date. And um, so I went and looked to, uh, through the, uh, uh, you know, planetary positions and whatever at that time, Venus was an extremely bright object in the uh, in the evening sky, in the southwest sky, it was near its maximum brilliance. And uh, yeah, you know, it was the kind of thing that you couldn't really miss seeing. And they were saying they were looking, you know, toward the southwest sky and it was about 25 degrees up or something. And Venus was 30 degrees up or whatever. And I said, well, okay, there's your, there's your, in, <laughs> there's your explanation. And it turns out it wasn't correct because Oh, actually, if I could pause you just for a second, Robert, yeah. I just want to emphasize that you were the one that figured out, you know, Venus was in that part of the sky. Yeah. Carter did not report seeing two objects. He only saw one object. Right. So that meant right. uh, it, it, it was almost certainly Venus unless the object was like right in front of it. Right. Well, so you like, would think so. But yes. And, what... and, so for 40 years, your findings were accepted as the story. Case closed, Carter saw Venus. Uh, yes. And then uh, six years ago, there was a development in the case for the first time in, in over 30 years. Right. Somebody, I can't remember his name, had uh, started to look this up because uh, he was uh, uh, apparently had worked or had knowledge of uh, the NASA used to be launching these little rockets uh, that had barium clouds and they would go up into the upper atmosphere and then they would fa- they would study the barium and how it uh, how it spread and how it behaved and this would tell them something about what was going on up there I don't know precisely how but they you know they got information from this and one of the sites where they were launching well the Wallops Island Virginia was one of those sites and I remember seeing one time one of those uh, launches and it was interesting it wasn't all that bright or all that uh, all that uh, you know I- impressive but uh, they also Eglin Air Force Base in Florida Panhandle which uh, is not that far from where Carter was so it was maybe a couple hundred miles this thing would go up you know and uh, and it probably went up into the sunlight because it wasn't that long after the sunset and mm-hmm. so it was quite a sight somebody this other researcher went and dug up the reports from January 6th of that year, because now it's online. When I first investigated this, there was no way you could get this information. Yes. But uh, now you can dig up newspaper uh, stories. Also, 
there was a brief mention in the APRA bulletin that, you know, on January 6th, people in the Southwest US saw this thing up there. Basically, what they saw was one of the barium clouds that was up, that was sent up, you know, on the rocket from, uh, from the Air Force Base. And um, knowing exactly where it was, and I have this, this is on my uh, blog. This mm-hmm. look uh, for Jimmy Carter yes. on, uh, on my uh, Bad UFOs blog. I have a chart that shows, here's the planetarium program, generates the sky at that time. Here's Venus, right next to Venus, a little bullseye. That's the calculated position of the barium cloud. Yes. And so they were right next to each other. Uh, yep. But what he described sounds more like the barium cloud than it does Venus. Oh, yes. So I suspect that was true. But on the other hand, you know, people will take, you know, a star or a planet and make all kinds of fanciful descriptions of it. So uh, you can't really, take, you know, place too much reliance That's on what it says. It, it, in a way, it seemed to me like you were ex- perhaps experiencing what class did regarding his plasma UFOs, where, you know, something that you investigated turned out to be different than you would believe for many years. And I was wondering, did you have a, an emotional reaction? How did you feel about it? It was like, oh, all that work and it wasn't Venus, it was this <laughs> cloud. No, I was surprised, but I looked at uh, the, the reports coming in that were published in some of the newspapers, like in Atlanta or wherever. And uh, yeah, it, 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 it was very convincing. And so I said, well, you know, after looking into this, I'd say, this looks very likely. Um, and then another, uh, a bit later, there's even more evidence came up and I said, oh, this, this clinches it. This is the, uh, you know, they saw this launch of this barium cloud from that uh, rocket. Um, and, and like a good skeptic, you went with the evidence, even yeah. though it wasn't what you had thought all those years. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it, it's interesting that uh, uh the uh, what are the implications for your excellent um, idea about the a witness uh, didn't report two objects they only reported one therefore it must be Venus well it turns out Carter knows what Venus is he's seen it in the sky and so he didn't make a mental note of it because it's like oh that's just Venus and it, it so that's why he reported Seeing yeah, because the, the, the cloud was something very unusual, I'm sure. Exactly. And so he, yeah. he didn't commit the Venus part to memory because it was uh, unremarkable that it be in that part of the sky. Ideally, yeah. he would have said, hey, it was right next to Venus. But because yeah. it was years later, I think he was just remembering what left an impression on him. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, it, to me, it, you know, it, these are uh, you and Philip class are skeptics that uh, walk the talk, you know, you're, yeah. you're, you're doing just what you say, you're, you're good examples uh, for the rest of us. Uh, I was thinking about at work. Sometimes I come up with a hypothesis for a spacecraft anomaly explanation. And sometimes I turn <laughs> out to be wrong and I just have to go with the flow, but there's definitely an emotional, um, you have your pet theory or whatever. Um, Listen, um, it looks like we have about 10 minutes left and I'll, I'll stick to your schedule unless you feel like, hey, maybe we could go a little over, but I, I'll, I'll- Well, my throat up. is getting to the point where it's- I understand. To take a All right, I'll, I'll stay to the original plan of another 12 minutes then. Um, let's see, so um, those are UFOs then. And now of course, we're, it's so involved now I just want to very briefly talk about. Yeah, the there's so ones. much stuff going on. But, and now of course, but the, the, the one that has gotten the most attention, I think, is the Navy UFOs. And I don't want to get too much because people can just Google it. But it seemed to me that the first question an investigative reporter would ask is, what does the um, creator of the sensor have to say about it? And, uh, you know, so I, I looked up, um, you know, the uh, uh, company is uh, Raytheon that made this sensor that created, you know, it was in this video. Right. And at the time, uh, Raytheon posted on its news feature page, and I'll read it very briefly. The UFO spotter, Navy pilots use Raytheon tech to track a strange UFO. And then it says here, I'm excerpting. 
to be uh, about the siding, to be really sure we would need the raw data, said Dr. Steve Cummings, Vice yeah. President of Technology Development and Execution at Raytheon Space and Airborne Systems. Visual displays alone are not the best evidence. I would well, not only that, we just have a, a, a cell phone video of the visual display. It, it, right? We don't even it, have a copy of the original data that produced the display. Right. I, I would want at least two sensors like radar and yeah. electro optical infrared to search the skies. One way to actually verify these and be absolutely certain that this is not an anomaly is to get the same target behaving the same way on multiple sensors. So it right. seems to me that we're still on square one uh, if this wasn't on also radar and other sensors as the inventor of this uh, sensor, it, it seems to me, talk to the expert about the sensor and then move on if in fact there is a way to move on. And it, it looks to me like the news media didn't do that. Right, well, if you want to, the best information about these things is available on over on Metabunk McWest site where he and a number of the people who are participating in analysis of these things, um, in a nutshell, uh, the Tic Tac so-called and the gimbal UFO appear to be distant jets. If you think it, you could find, uh, and Mick West has done this, to find other um, you know, it, videos with the infrared, what does a, if a jet is 50 miles away and you're looking at its infrared signature in one of these things, what do you see? Well, you see very much what this is. Um, so they don't really know the, the distance to the object. Uh, it, it very well. The, uh, the interesting thing is now the other one that the, 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 of the three original videos, one of them is called the go fast and it's just like this little dot, little white dot. Yes. Which is either a balloon or a, a large bird. I think it's more likely a balloon, but could be either one. And they're saying, wow, look at that thing go. Look how fast it's going. Wait a minute. You know, they're in this jet that's traveling at 400 miles an hour. And they're looking at this thing that's below them, thousands of feet below them. And it's either not moving at all or moving only very slowly. And so if you're if if, if this thing is here and you know, and your jet is going like this, it's gonna look like the object is moving backwards at this tremendous rate. Right. And I mean, anybody can see that it's elementary geometry. Right. It, it, anybody who thinks that the go fast was actually going fast doesn't understand anything about optics or geometry or anything else. And this is the thing, the so-called, uh, whatever they call it now, they're UFO, you know, they call them UFOs, they call them UAPs, or UAP task force in the Pentagon. Yes. Oh, wow, this is really, I don't think I understand a thing. That's an example of what, what expertise at the Pentagon is like in photography. I'm sure it's not that bad. I'm sure that the people who deal with, you know, satellite photos and so understand this far better than they do. Why not consult somebody who knows something about photography instead of this? And then this other one, it's uh, the triangle objects. Uh, this came later than the uh, the Tic Tac uh, thing after the Tom DeLonge show was finished with, uh, yes. you know, his uh, To the Stars and so on. They kind of like collapsed at the end of, uh, uh, around the January of um, 2021. And... Uh, now the different people and different organizations looking in. Jeremy Corbell is now, I guess, moved in to take this place. And one of, so one of the one of the videos that these guys are now promoting is uh, they say it looks like um, triangle-shaped objects, and the sky is full of them around the uh, uh, around the ship. And well, somebody using one of these ridiculous pseudonyms, I don't remember what it was put this on Reddit and then later put it on the Metabunk and then Nick West did some, some more work on it. And uh, yes, this is, it, it identified what it was that first of all, these things appeared to have a triangular shape because that was the aperture of this infrared device. And, you know, a camera has a, uh, you know, a diaphragm like this. Some yes. of these infrared devices actually had triangular diaphragms. That's so right. an out of focus image is going to be triangular. So these are out of focus images. What do they show? And it's been very clearly pointed out. This is Jupiter is in the constellation of uh, Scorpius and you could see Antares and the tail of the scorpion and Jupiter sitting there exactly where it was at the time that the video was made. 
Uh, and then there's an airplane going along blinking. Of course, the airplane is also triangular shaped because yes. everything is out of focus. And so they think, oh, these triangular UFOs flying around. Again, the idiots didn't know a thing about optics. Right. They even put this forward. And then it could be clearly, clearly, you know, matched up exactly with right. stars of Scorpius and, and other nearby oh, constellations yeah. of Jupiter. Yeah. What's, you know, this is what fools are, a UFO experts? I, mean, <laughs> I know, it's, I've, I've suggested people uh, Google Pentagon UFO videos and the details you just provided are, are uh, per, you know, shown there uh, with additional. Yeah. Uh, well, it's so on my have, blog. I've got, a, I've got a lot of information about these on the Bad UFOs blog. Oh, just, oh, yes. just look for oh. it there. There's a little search box in the corner and just look for like triangle yeah, UFO yeah. or something for, like that. Forgive me, since yeah. we have such yeah. little time left, I wanted to do very targeted, brief questions to try to get uh, what, what we can out of the last couple of minutes. Um, again, unfortunately, we can't uh, go any longer. But uh, I, I was thinking for myself, there is one UFO case that's really remarkable. And I, I don't think it's necessarily an alien, but it, it, it's the most interesting. And I was wondering if you might have one. Again, unfortunately, we can only spend a few seconds. And that is uh, the first interstellar object observed. So Oumuamua, <laughs> again, it's like, wow, it's, it, it, we know it's interstellar. So it's a step above other UFOs. And it did change course when it was passing through our solar system. And there are discussions of prosaic explanations. But to me, what, what's most remarkable sociologically is that the UFO people didn't really get interested in it uh, because I think it isn't really a, a personal, you know, uh, yeah. I saw this near my house or whatever. It's, it's esoteric. Well, this was seen only by observatories. Or exactly. Very large so it, it's, it's too distant to kind of yeah. fit into the UFO. No, but, then it, but it is becoming a big thing now because of uh, right. uh, Avi Loeb. Uh, Avi Loeb and the so called right. Galileo Project. Oh, yes. Uh, and and uh, if we had more time, we could talk about this. Exactly. Uh, so, basically, yeah, these people know nothing about UFO history. Yes. Uh, Loeb seems to think that all he has to do is he's, he's proposing that they use a network of four inch telescopes that they're going to set up and he's going to connect them with computers or something. And okay. That's all well and good. And then uh, somehow right. he's going to, UFOs are going to fly by and he's going to get them. But uh, because of, you know, having multiple cameras, he'll get the exact speed and you know position and everything like that he thinks he's going to resolve details on them he has no idea how many people have in the past have set up all these different networks with photography and so on and again that's on the bad ufos blog and just yes. look up galileo project now he's got um uh, jock Vallee as one of his key people there he's got nick pope you know, who keeps talking oh, yes. about alien invasions. These are believers. And, oh, and, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah and, fo folks can can learn more. Uh, again, I wanted to get unique info in my last <laughs> dwindling moments here. Um, he, here's something maybe I shouldn't waste time on, but I, I did want to get your take because you've been watching this, participating in this for decades, right? Yeah. So you, you oh, go yeah. back to the 1960s. Can you extrapolate from what you have observed sociologically to kind of predict where it's going to go? So there's, you know, uh, uh, government cover-ups is part of the <laughs> sociological thing. Uh, abductions is part of it, but they kind of come and go. Yeah, I think abductions are passe. No, but what do you think new might happen? I realize that's um, putting you on the spot. <laughs> uh, it, it's really hard to say what they're going to come up with. I think that what will happen is this uh, Galileo project will basically go nowhere. There'll be a lot of excitement and a lot of talk, and maybe they'll set up some cameras and then nothing will happen. And after 10 years, they'll probably tire of it and they'll definitely move on to something else. Yes. So, um, all right. Um, yeah, here's my hope about the future. And that is obviously we're getting better and better equipment, but also we have resources we didn't in the past in terms of, you know, showing airplane pilot trainees or even just, you know, kids in astronomy class. Here's a video of a fireball. It's like, oh, now I know what a fireball looks like. Um, and other phenomena in the sky so that in a way everybody's sort of a trained observer and they're much less likely to report uh, something that uh, you know an astronomer would recognize as being you know nothing remarkable and then another thing is 
there are technical improvements coming. Uh, even one of our members who's very sympathetic to uh, you know, UFOs maybe being something interesting, he's working on an, a smartphone app. So you know, everybody that has the app gets an alert. Hey, I saw something. Go outside. Here's where I am. And so you can kind of triangulate, like uh, yeah, Mufon was had something like this, or at least announced something like this. I don't know yeah. if it ever came to pass. Yeah, so they were going to do that too. Yeah, and so um, you know, the American Meteor Society does that really well. You know, where witnesses report, and then you can figure out, hey, where did this thing pass over, and so on, and even perhaps re recover any re um, uh, remnant material that may have reached the ground. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I want to close out in my final seconds by thanking you so much. And uh, yeah, you, you are a font of information. <laughs> and unfortunately, we couldn't get the full um, stream uh, uh, as far as it could go. We, we do have to have a hard stop time here. And um, we are going to have uh, some social time, but unfortunately, you, you won't be able to uh, join us uh, on this Zoom call after you uh, depart. Um, I am gonna just take a minute here to um, uh, read off um, you know, the final comments. Of, of course, as I just said, thank you, Robert. Um, and um, I wanna also thank um, uh, JD Mack for producing today's program. Mm -hmm. um, those of you in the Washington DC area, uh, be sure to join us in person on Wednesday, April 27th, when we present the 2022 Philip J. Class Award, as I mentioned earlier, for outstanding contributions in critical thinking and scientific understanding to Susan Gerbeck for her success in maintaining Wikipedia's accuracy on issues of science and pseudoscience. And join us a few days later, Saturday, April 30th, when Susan Gerbeck presents Grief Vampires, Wikipedia and More, that's April 30th, at Arlington Central Library, 1.30 p.m. Our website will have the details, ncas.org. Thanks again to Mr. Schaefer. As I said, thanks to J.D. Mack and uh, fellow NCAST members. Check your email inboxes now and join us on Zoom for online social time uh, starting in just a few minutes. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>